What's going on, Foot Clan? We got a great episode today. Jason and I are breaking down some bounce back candidates. It's where you can find value in drafts. Make sure you click like, subscribe, and enjoy the episode. I want to thank Warby Parker for sponsoring today's show. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Sunglasses, progressives, like I have, and blue light lenses are also available. Uh, these are super easy to try on at home. I did the try-on program. You could do it with your friends before purchasing. Let, let them, you know... Get their opinions. They'll be like, no, you look really stupid in yeah, that, Jason. Yeah, you look stupid, Jason. Try that other pair. Oh, but look how good I look in that you one. You look great. You could try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses. Try them on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy. The ship's free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash footballers. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Happy Tuesday, Jason. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Just two dudes, and we're having a good time. Just going to be a great day. What's going on, Foot Clan? Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and a big cardboard bear with you this fine July 6th morning, afternoon, whenever you're listening. It's nice to be back with... Uh, with you, Jason. Yes, it's good to have you here. <laughs> um, it's going to be, It's I, I don't know why, but today is going to be a great day. Bounce back, players, on today's show. We're going to. not why. Oh, it isn't? I mean, the bounce back picks are incredible. Okay, but, but is it Jay Grizz related? I mean, eh, he's. Not really. Uh, you know? Is it because Mike's not here that we're celebrating? That's closer, warmer. But no, Mike would have a great time here huh. um, in Arizona. In Phoenix, the land of the sun. <laughs> oh, baby! The Suns are in the finals! But but this is a fantasy football podcast! Stop talking! Shut your mouth! <laughs> shut, just shut your mouth! We waited 28 years! Yeah, it's a 28-year wait. For, you can wait a week of us talking about the Suns. Oh, baby! How you feeling? I'm feeling Suns in four, baby. And all, for all my Bucks fan friends out there, I know there's a lot of you listening to your Bucks fans. You're all stupid. You're all dumb, and you're gonna lose. <laughs> uh, but we love you, and thank you for listening and supporting the show. Uh, we could talk about fantasy football now. Okay, you got it out for a bit. Yeah, there's a game game tonight, so uh, <laughs> yes, there is. We'll be there. You yes, and I, we you will. and I, will be there with, with bells on. Yep, for sure. I really enjoyed Jason as the voice of public opinion and immediately yelling back at yourself. At yes. Us. I'm a, I have lots <laughs> of personalities in here. Well, and people had been waiting for, I mean, maybe not everyone, but waiting for the reaction. And we had a couple of shows that we had pre-recorded. Mike was going out of town. You didn't get to see the visceral response. Of, and the last time on the main show that we did call our shot on a pre-recording, <laughs> it did not work out so well. So just to be clear. Mm-hmm. We are currently hated by Lakers fans, right? Uh, Nuggets fans, less so. <laughs> uh, Clippers fans, correct. Which is great and, because that's a two for one on cities, right? Because it's just Los Angeles. Okay, we're out. Uh, and then the Bucks fans, obviously. There, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. But the nice thing about you know, look out, up there in, fear in the Milwaukee, deer, they say fear the yeah, right. Like, I'm, I'm building buck hunter as soon as I get home. Jason is uh, we you know we just need to win yeah we're gonna need that <laughs> um but we do have bounce back players for fantasy football on today's show we've got NFL news to talk about a dynasty download we're going to get into uh I want to encourage everybody to check us out over on Instagram you can check us out on Twitter at the FF ballers join the foot.com's the community you want to join a league with a bunch of great people we've got about 13,000 strong 
as part of the Foot Clan, and so you can get into leagues with those people. You can check that out at jointhefoot.com. Oh, man. What a day. What a day. I hope I hope it's a, a great ending to this day. I do, too. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. Uh, Al Borland is not... Uh, we won't force him onto the microphone this morning. I mean, he's uh, he gave me the thumbs up as he is... Uh, recovering from some surgery that he got done that has made his voice sound like he's a different person. However, he wanted me to let the Bucks fans know that Bambi's not that scary to him. Mm, nice. That's, well that done. That was his one-liner. Well done. I was going to mock your voice, but that was the voice of a champion. So, yeah. well done. All right. The uh, Falcons have signed number four overall pick, Kyle Pitts, to a four-year $32.9 million contract. Eh, no big deal. It's just more fully guaranteed money than any tight end in the NFL. He doesn't even need to perform, Jason. No, no, Andy. He sure really doesn't. <laughs> he does not need to perform. He's, uh, it's fully guaranteed. That's what it means. So if he flames out, he'll get his money and run. He's not going to flame out. He's great. Um, I still, obviously, we've talked ad nauseum, but newer listeners are coming back uh, as we get closer to football season. I still think Kyle Pitts is being overblown for redraft. I love him in Dynasty. But this year... He's, I mean, uh, we'll I, find out. We'll find out what yes, the draft, because right now it, it, we can look at ADPs. He's fifth round pick. I'm like, whatever. You can take the shot on a top five tight end there with Kyle Pitts if you believe he could do that. But what will he be in August? If he's a fifth round pick in August, that's way too high for me. So you, you find that draft position. Like, I don't think it's going down. I doubt Kyle Pitts. The athletic freak that he is. Exactly right. I doubt if we get into training camp and we see video and we get into preseason and we see video of, you know. Rookies always go up the closer to the season, always. So he'll be a fourth-round pick. At, yeah, so at the very lowest, if you're drafting now, or, or maybe he doesn't rise, but the lowest he will be is a fifth-round pick. And like you said, you said, well, can if we, you want to take your shot at that. Can we get fully guaranteed production like his contract? Uh, no, no, we can't. <laughs> um, and that's that's the problem. He is still a rookie. I know that that's like I'm not allowed to say that about Kyle Pitts. Um, How dare you? For, thank you. Uh, but the reality is, in order for a fifth round pick at tight end to pay off, like he, let's say he finishes the, as the tight end five, that is a terrible pick in the fifth round. In the because tight end five, six, seven. Like I remember, I I had Trey Burton as as a my guy several years ago. He finished the year as the tight end seven. You're not okay and he was worthless. Like, Mark Andrews gives you Mark Andrews stuff in the fifth round? Well, like, when you say Mark Andrews, that was the tight end two season when he had a ton of touchdowns. That's the Mark Andrews name you're talking about. If he has a top three season, then a fifth round pick pays off. But if he's tight end six, seven, that that is – it might sound good on paper, and at the end of the year, you and Mike will be like, oh, you didn't like the tight end six. But through the year, you'll be like, yeah, it's, it's mostly unusable. So are you calling for a pit stop? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I am. And okay. well done. I give that a seven. <laughs> All right. Dallas Cowboys were selected to appear on the five episode Hard Knocks for 2021. Brooks, how are you feeling about your hometown team, your favorite team, I should say, appearing on Hard Knocks? Are you ready to see this dysfunction up close? No, I don't think they should do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want them? Uh, I mean, the storylines are great. It, it is. It is funny to think like the if return the of Dak. Oh, the return of Dak, the update uh, on just more information on Zeke. Is he still got it? Which, of course, spoiler alert, he'll have it on Hard Knocks. Like, everything will... It, the, Can the, they fit his head onto the screen? Is that a thing? That yeah, they've got do? wide angles now. Okay. It's right. it's uh, it's great. This is the third time that the Cowboys have now been on Hard Knocks. Um, so they are a favorite of the program. But... Um, the 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 hard knocks bump. The, the players don't go down; they go up. You know, the, once you get a little bit extra exposure and play in the media, the, it'll be quote unquote good for the value of uh, Dak, Amari, uh, CD, uh, Zeke. They'll all get a hard knocks bump and rise up a little bit. Cowboys running backs coach Josh Hicks says Zeke is 
way quicker, way more elusive, more fluent what? than he was. Oh, his fluency is outstanding. <laughs> I his, haven't heard that his, one. Uh, you know, his use of the of the English language right. is <laughs> is just amazing. So, uh, you you care about that statement from the Cowboys running backs coach at all? Uh, not really. Um, I, I care. Is that, it a way of conceding that last year he wasn't those things? He wasn't quick. He wasn't elusive. He wasn't fluent. Right. That that is in a way saying that it, he looks better now than he did last year. So he didn't look as good last year. F factual, logical, you know, t train of math, as they say. Yeah, they weren't content with what he did last year. Right. And so the truth is, what what we want from Zeke this year is for him to be quicker, more elusive. More fluent. More fluent. Um, I assume that means in the offense or something. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> um, his Spanish is off the charts. He's he's down with a babble, and he is little fifteen minute blurbs. <laughs> They're working <laughs> wonders. Um, but the, but you don't take any of this because what do you think the running back coach is going to say? Oh, Zeke's a bum. Right. He's you know it's like it's always this is why we say look for the bad news, not the good news from training camps. Right. Because the good news is there's plenty of it. Yeah, everyone looks great. Speaking of which, uh, Daniel Popper of The Athletic reporting that Chargers offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi is excited about Mike Williams' skill set and expects him to be featured as the X in the offense. Well, Mike, uh, Joe Lombardi and uh, Jason Moore are very similar in the sense that we're excited about his skill set and expect him to be featured as the team's X. I mean, that was right. What, what, isn't that what, what we gonna... already expected coming into the season? He's the clear... Um, outside wide receiver for the team. It's just a matter for fantasy is can he actually stay healthy and and not just you and know target play share. games target share. Yeah. but be healthy while he's on the field. Brought him up as a potential sleeper. We talked about him in recent weeks. So you know he's got the pedigree, size, skill. Has to stay healthy. We all love Justin Herbert. There is potential there. Um, and, and he's so, like a he's one of your last picks right now yeah and when I look at the last picks in drafts there's very few people that check all of those boxes that you said and, and the number one box to me is Justin Herbert the fact that you have a guy tied to an up-and-coming quarterback that could come out this year and throw 38 touchdowns and if he does Mike Williams has a great season let me ask you Mike Williams late late round pick or Another player connected to a great quarterback, MVP candidate. Uh, talking about D Derek Carr? Henry uh, Rose, no, no, I'm talking mm -hmm. about Emmanuel Sanders in Buffalo, who replaces John Brown in that role in the offense. We haven't talked almost at all, not a whisper, about Emmanuel Sanders this offseason. Would you rather take the shot on Mike Williams with Justin Herbert or Sanders in the offense you know is going to throw the ball a ton in Buffalo? I, I would rather take Mike Williams because I think even though the baseline is higher for Emmanuel Sanders, they they used John Brown quite a bit when he was healthy. The role is there, and I love his talent. I don't think that there is a, a you know an outcome when you're taking that last pick where you go, I got a star this year. And I think Mike Williams could actually be a star this year, whereas Emmanuel Sanders could be a, a serviceable flex option that is – more reliable than we thought in draft season. Sure. Makes sense. All right. That was today's news and notes presented, as always, by Sleeper. Make sure you switch your league to the fastest growing fantasy platform today. If you've gotten into the draft analyzer, which is part of the UDK Plus, I have. You can import your roster from both Sleeper and ESPN, and we will pull that roster in. You can get a grade, you can get your team analyzed, uh, you can share it with us and with others on Twitter. Um, on social media, uh, brag a, a little bit about what you've got going on. I've seen some teams that are, they should be illegal in uh, at least the continental U.S. They're too good. Um, and then I've seen the other side where maybe we're not as generous with our you know thoughts on your roster and they got a bone to pick with us. Yeah, I think we do need to make one change because it always shows which one of the ballers likes your team the best. And when it's a really bad team, then I feel bad when it's like, Jason likes your team the best. Right. It, we should really change it to be who who hates your team the most. Oh, <laughs> when when you're like a C or lower, it should be Jason despises oh this team the most. All right, we're going to get into bounce back players. If you want to check out the Ultimate Draft Kit, you can do so at ultimatedraftkit.com. Let's do it. Hello, everybody. I am back. 
We spent a long time last week kind of looking over last year's average draft position, trying to identify players that we had confidence in as bounce back candidates, right? And that's a tough one because you have a precedent of a bad season. And in the NFL where careers are short, predicting somebody to kind of return to form, that can be a hard thing. And there were there were players we looked at and we thought about, you know, Oh, that guy, he had a bad year, and then we're like, oh, he's going to keep having bad years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no comeback for Todd Gurley. Right, he's not a bounce-back candidate. We both picked a couple of guys that we identified as bounce-back candidates for 2021, and then when we get done with those, we're going to go through some of the names that the Foot Clan and others brought up on social media and whether we believe a bounce-back is possible for them. I will give you the floor uh, to select your first bounce-back candidate, and we can discuss from there all right um i will take the floor and i will stand on a soapbox so everybody can on the see floor me. that you took right right a big, i put the soapbox, soapbox then i stood on that so i'm uh, i'm above and that's all a, is that a wooden box the uh, soapbox that's a good question i always see a soapbox better not be like cardboard a, no it's, <laughs> it's like a crate <laughs> it's a weight joke yeah, i get a, it it's a crate yeah it's, which is wood um and they keep soap in it yeah so i'm gonna talk about michael thomas um, Michael Thomas is being disrespected right now, which is fantastic. You want to find fantasy football, uh, you know, NFL, NFL players that are being disrespected because that's where you find value. And I think that's Michael Thomas right now. Michael Thomas had a horrific year. Um, not only was he injured for a portion of it, but that wasn't that wasn't it. Like if you look at when he was now, you're calling forty for four thirty eight, no touchdowns, a bad year. I'm saying it's not great. <laughs> I'm saying you didn't enjoy it. Well, uh, the nice thing is um, he did have one top twenty uh, week on the season, one of them. Oh, so that's okay. not good. The resume is getting better and better. Yeah, I mean he he really did have a poor season. Now, um, even when he played. Even when he played. So he, he missed about half the season. Um, and when he was there, he didn't have a great year. And the reason he didn't have a great year is touchdowns. You just said it. How many touchdowns did he have last year? Uh, zero. Zero. No touchdowns. That's a bad, bad year. Michael Thomas, I don't know if you remember two things, but these are two things you need to remember to understand why he is uh, a huge bounce back candidate for me. I need this message because I am on the outside of that belief. I'm the lowest among the three of us uh, in terms of ranking him for the season. I have a lot of doubt about the quarterback. I have now at least seven games for Michael Thomas where I'm, you know, where he's on the field and I'm displeased. There were a lot of question marks about him being unhappy with the organization these are the reasons why I have some fear. And we brought up like Larry Fitzgerald has had bad years because of bad quarterback play or inconsistent quarterback play. So you you need to make the case to me and get me on board with the value here. Yeah, and I'm excited to do that. We we brought up Michael uh, or Emmanuel. Unfortunately, S your time is up. Oh man. And that I wasn't sucks. convinced. But Brooks, I wanna... were you convinced? Nope. Time's no, up. All Sorry. right. All right. Well, let's talk about George Kittle because <laughs> I want you to convince me. <laughs> All right. All right. He, so here's the thing with with Michael Thomas. Um, he had a bad year, and the reason he had a horrific year was uh, the the touchdowns being gone. But the two things you have to remember about Michael Thomas: one is how good he is. You you he was the wide receiver one overall by a wide margin just a couple years ago. He has always been a top ten wide receiver in his career until the year where he was both injured uh, and had no touchdowns. And the other thing you have to remember is that touchdowns are a non-sticky stat. They are the the thing that will come with yards. I love target. This is why I like Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore, Michael Thomas, these guys who they should have had more touchdowns, and they will come. And I'm not talking like you have to be a touchdown machine, but just NFL average touchdown pace based on yardage. He had four games with Taysom Hill last year. Michael Thomas did. He was healthy for uh, healthy in quotes because Michael Thomas was super. Was he ever healthy last super year? Super injured last year. He was playing through because he knew it was Drew Brees' last season and he wanted his chance to go and get that title. He should not have been playing. He said he should not have been playing. Now he's going to come back healthy. But even a hobbled Michael Thomas with Emmanuel Sanders and Jared Cook on the team. Do you realize that he averaged 9.3 targets and 7.5 receptions for 85.8 yards per game with 
Taysom Hill. Those are great numbers. The 17-game pace, just so you... That's a lot of yards. It would be 157 targets, 127 receptions, 1,400 yards. Now, that's a small sample size to extrapolate. I'm not... I don't have well, a statted down for... you got four more seasons to extrapolate. You've got 125 for 1,400, 185 for 1,700 the year before. Well, that's what's great. Like, his 86 yards per game, well, that's just his career average. So, it's not, it's not rude to be like, oh, let's extrapolate that. He's a world class wide receiver he is the clear cut wide receiver one for this team he's their one two and three he's their one two and three he will have 150 plus targets and we saw Taysom Hill targets get caught at 81 percent last year like what more do you want from a guy that he didn't get the touchdowns he's going to be healthy he's the one two and three for his offense it's still a you know Sean Payton led it's going to be a good offense and if if Winston is the quarterback I would say it's only up from there. So I think third round pick right now. Oh man, if you can start of the your third. draft, stud running back, stud running back, and Michael then Thomas. Michael Thomas, who could be a top five wide receiver, great, or a stud running back, grab Kelsey if he falls to the second, and then Michael Thomas in the third. Like I love Michael Thomas this year. He's I am always for my wide receiver one. I want the volume guy. I want the guy with 150 targets, and if I can get a volume wide receiver one with 150 plus targets who has been the wide receiver one in the third round sign me up all day michael thomas or justin jefferson for that, you, for your tears because that, yes that was the one name i wanted to bring up because i would prefer to have michael thomas which would be a, a differentiation from our consensus tiers right now our tier one wideouts are adams and hill they're yeah. alone and then tier two is Diggs, ridley hopkins and then our Justin Jefferson sitting in tier three by himself, and Michael Thomas should be there for my rankings. Sure, he, he would be my, Michael Thomas, um, which would be above Metcalf, Robinson, Keenan. He's my number seven wide receiver, right? And so to get that in the third round with the pedigree he has, the health coming back, and the fact that there is no one else there to catch the ball. The reason that Adam Troutman is getting love is because it's like it's Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara. I mean, that's it. Which would I mean without Mike here? We didn't have any of that trout face stuff. Well, I mean, look, if oh, Terry Grizz if loves one thing, it's trout. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He he took offense to the one, two, and three of Michael Thomas, thinking that Adam Troutman is. Yeah, he wants a lot of trout. In He's the, a hungry boy. Um. Well, good. You bringing up Michael Thomas first is going to change the order in which I bring up my bounce back players. But I have to pause real quick and thank today's sponsor, HelloFresh. You know about HelloFresh. We've talked about them. You get fresh, pre-measured ingredients. Mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Uh, had some uh, HelloFresh last week. It was absolutely perfect. Um, just fully renewed my love of HelloFresh. Whole family liked it, which is just like a home run. Not to sit down and have something where like mom and dad like it, but the kids don't like it. They cut all the stress out of meal planning, grocery store trips. You get to enjoy the cooking and the dinner on the table. You get to do it in 30 minutes or less. That's what HelloFresh is all about. Super delicious food, lots of variety, lots of options depending on your dietary needs. They've got uh, 50 different menu items a week. So go to HelloFresh.com slash footballers14 and use the code footballers14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com slash footballers14 and use the code footballers14 for 14 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, so I assume because I teased George Kittle and I want to hear about George Kittle, you're not going to talk George Kittle? That's correct. Okay, well, yeah. I want to hear it, though. Um, Sorry. You're still going to bring it up later, though? Yeah. Okay. We'll talk I'll about wait. him later. Uh, maybe. I mean, if that's my bounce back. We don't player. run out of time. Chris Godwin is the player that I want to bring up for my bounce back. And so staying in the wide receiver realm and identifying, you know, Michael Thomas, Chris Godwin, when, you, when I look at both of those players, I am still – I have more confidence in Chris Godwin bouncing back than I do Michael Thomas. I have my, um, I have confidence that Chris Godwin is going to deliver a season more similar to the one that we were so excited with as fantasy players, the number two overall fantasy finish in 2019, which he did, if you remember, in 14 games he finished number two in 2019 com compared to last year. I mean, last year was a down year. Um, you know, Michael Thomas littered with injuries through the year, no Drew Brees in parts of the season. 
Chris Godwin's year was kind of a fatiguing one for fantasy players. 65 for 840 and 7. He finishes the wide receiver 32, nowhere close to where you wanted him to finish when you drafted him and just kind of left you feeling maybe a little confused, maybe a little frustrated. His ADP's in the fourth round. He's a round later hmm. than Michael Thomas. I love I, – I, I don't love that for saying, oh, I'll take more value over Michael Thomas. I love it for taking both of those guys. Which you could do. Oh, baby. Which you just brought up starting the year with running back, running back. Michael like Thomas, stud, Chris Godwin. And then Michael Thomas, Chris Godwin. And Let's that go. is a That is a real roster you could run out there. And I'm the highest on my, uh, Chris Godwin going into the 2021 season amongst the three of us. Fundamental arguments are similar to Michael Thomas's, where this is an elite wide receiver at the NFL level. Over the last three seasons, there are only seven players that have 3,000 receiving yards and a 70-plus percentage catch rate. Michael Thomas is one of those guys. Chris Godwin is, is one of those guys. He has the highest yards per reception in that group. Michael Thomas, you know that the recipe for Thomas is 11-yard catches. Uh, Chris Godwin's up at 14.36 in that span, and two of the seven pass catchers in that group are tight ends. It's Kittle and, and Kelsey. So the elite level of talent that we know that Godwin has, the production we've seen on the on the field, look, last year's 17-game pace, which you did that with Thomas, take the injuries out of it, he's still 92 for 11, 90, and 10 on 119 targets last year with Tom Brady. Brought it up again on the show many times, but... Year two in the Bruce Arians offense is always better for the quarterback. And unless you're doubting Brady on age, I think we're going to see a well-oiled machine in this offense. And Brady loves him. His, his quarterback rating when targeting Chris Godwin's 131.7. Fifth highest in the NFL. This is his guy, and he could very much be his number one throughout the year. Mike's brought up uh, Antonio Brown and him being in the offense. Obviously, Mike Evans is there. But from a talent perspective, he wins at every single level on the field. And there were pretty much you know, no differences in where he was targeted on the field between the number two overall fantasy finish and the number you know, 32 injury riddled year last year. So I do think that in the fourth round, you know, we have short memories. Fantasy players, they just want to chase. I mean, you forget how long or how far Stephon Diggs went in last year's draft. Mm -hmm. So Godwin in the fourth round to me, he's got top 10 upside. He could have top, you know, eight, top seven. What are your what are your concerns with a bounce back from Chris, Chris Godwin? The you know that year that you brought up, Michael Thomas number one. Godwin was number two that year. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have any problems with the Chris Godwin bounce back. I see it. I think this is going to be an outstanding offense. And Brady, you know, the second half of last year, uh, starting the week that they signed and. and activated Antonio Brown they had Antonio Brown Mike Evans and Chris Godwin healthy and what I want to say narrative wise is I worry about consistency because you've got three legit options that's not even to talk about Gronk or Brady's tendency to throw to the running back and with that many mouths to feed you it's going to be difficult to be consistent but it's just probably not true we saw it last year um they were all very consistent for wide receiver metrics during that run up to the Super Bowl. So I think it's just a great offense. It's so long as the, you know, minor knee surgeries on old man Brady aren't a problem. I, I only see two outcomes. I see Brady collapse and it's the end. And because someday it will happen. Or Brady is That's what they tell me. an MVP candidate because he's got these weapons and those weapons are great for fantasy. And that's the one I'm betting and on. And I saw you took Brady in the mock draft. Oh, yeah. I mean, Brady's my quarterback five. You must have been happy that I wasn't there to fight for him. <laughs> I was. So it was very nice having him <laughs> drop to me comfortably. And, and let's be realistic with Godwin. Bounce back doesn't mean he has to go back to the number two fantasy finish necessarily. Last year on a per-game basis, his touchdown uh, per game average was the same as his 2019 number two overall finish. I like seeing that. 0. 0.6 touchdowns per game on a per game basis. His yardage, it was five for 70 per game as opposed to six for 95 in that number two overall finish. But playing through injury, acclimation, not there some of the season. Um, 
I think, you know, he's he's ADP's wide receiver 16, top 10. I think he can finish as a top 10 guy, which would be a steal yeah. in that range. So um, only two wide receivers, by the way, last year finished at 90-plus at every single level of the field. Godwin and one more. And I doubt you'd guess uh, it. I don't know I, if you saw it in I our showdown. I didn't see it, but there's no way I'd guess it. Because I saw, I saw Kyle post this on Twitter and I know that nobody nobody got it. I'll, yeah, I'll say the behind the line of scrimmage is the key. Oh, there. so is it like Debo or getting closer? Ayuk, Ayuk. All right, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, only Godwin Ayuk graded at ninety plus at every single level of the field. So okay, that was a good. Okay. That Thanks was a good hint the there, Brooks. Yeah. Brooks. All right, you want to hit your second bounce back player? Yeah, my second bounce back player. This is one I am not as confident in as Michael Thomas. But I want to paint the path for a true massive uh, bounce yeah, back. Yeah, I call like, it bounce back. Uh, well, it's certainly a bounce back, but a, but almost a breakout, a re-breakout, if you will. It's Matthew Stafford, quarterback a for the Los Angeles back? Rams. A re-break bounce back. <laughs> um, Matthew Stafford has an opportunity to go nuts this year. Um, it's a matter of what kind of team, what kind of system, you know, we, you, over the last couple of years, we have seen the Los Angeles Rams be a, a great otherworldly offense with Jared Goff at the helm, Todd Gurley being healthy and their, you know, they, their system has actually been a, a very, uh, good system for running backs, especially around the goal line, the touchdown rate for running backs. They, you know, once they get in there, they're going to run the ball in for a score. They, Sean McVay has a, a, a great system to do that. The offensive line has been capable of doing that. Whether Matthew Stafford has a great season versus a good season is entirely on the back of touchdowns. And, you can argue which have plummeted in recent years oh, for the, him compared to well, what he used to be. Well, yeah, to, to the 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 bounce back is talking about 2011 through 2017 where Matthew Stafford was 6 out of 7 years in a row he was a top 10 fantasy quarterback. This is a guy who can get it done for fantasy for sure. Now he's on a much better team, much better offense with better weapons. Maybe not the elite, like Kenny Galladay might have been better. Obviously, Calvin Johnson was better, but it was always them and nobody. And and even when it was him and, and Marvin Jones, they were, you know, not always healthy together. This last year, he finishes the quarterback 15 for a bad team while being injured and having pretty much no Kenny Galladay. But I circle back to the touchdowns because the way that I've projected it, and we know Cam Akers very high in my rankings, I am projecting more of the same from the Rams. But I want to paint the picture because we have to look at all angles in fantasy and say, okay, okay, it could be more of the same as what we've seen. We've got the historic evidence for it. Or let me ask this question. When they got near the goal line, did they run the ball so much because they had Jared Goff and Todd Gurley? Like whose hands did you want to put the ball in at the five, trust Jared Goff to make a play happen or give it to your world-class high first-round pick running back. Like, maybe the reason they ran in so many touchdowns is entirely because of the personnel, not the scheme. So I could see a world where now they're saying, do we want to put it in the inexperienced Cam Akers' hands or Matthew Stafford, let him scramble around and, and find someone for a touchdown. If Matthew Stafford comes out and throws 35-plus touchdowns, he will be a top-five quarterback. Because the yards will be there, um, you know he's he's a very very capable quarterback, and they paid a lot to go and get their guy. Um, he's also still young enough to get it done. He's Thirty three. Yeah, I, I mean this is not like over the hill for uh, for Stafford. So with the offense, with uh, a capable offensive coordinator, probably the best core of receiving weapons he's ever had. If the touchdowns come, he's a great late certainly, round pick. Certainly with the best play caller he's ever been with. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I do want to, like, if you just look at career finishes, the last three years have been rough, right? 20, 29 with the injuries and 15. But I want, I do want people to remember what 2019 was like in those eight games. The eight-game pace is awesome. The eight-game pace was uh, 5,300 yards and 40 touchdowns. So the the eight That's games, the eight games that he played, he had five top six finishes at the quarterback position. Uh, pretty much undrafted that season. So if you picked him up late, you streamed him, you played him, you lived in a very happy place for those eight games before he went down. So 
I don't think he's being drafted or talked about very much. It would be a bounce back to kind of those big time years he had uh, seasons ago. But, you know, if, if people have been making the compelling case for Jared Goff and fantasy off seasons for three years, I don't really understand how Matthew Stafford, other than a complete lack of seeing it with your eyeballs, because you've never seen him in this jersey, you've never seen him with this scheme, you've never seen him with these wideouts. And so I think that that kind of ambiguity has caused him to be ignored. Yeah, so I, mean, I think that that's fair. I mean, it, it's still a scary proposition and far from a guarantee. Yeah, when I look at the late round quarterbacks, um, what you're – which is which is you know where we as as a show are usually drafting from. Um, I'm wanting to find someone who can get off to a hot start, who could become a you know a top eight quarterback over the course of the season that just takes that leap. And there are enough markers here with Stafford being given a great receiving core, great offensive play caller, and you know the opportunity to truly uh, you know scorch the earth. And I think they're going to let him because. They knew what their hole was on offense, and it was Jared Goff. Like, nobody in the world thought Jared Goff is this great quarterback. He was just good enough to run the system. And they, they're like, yeah, it was good enough to get us to a Super Bowl, but we want to win one, and it's we've got to have a guy that can make plays on his own. Yeah, and in the red zone when you need him. It's amazing how many similarities there are to the Jared Goff and Jimmy Garoppolo situations because both guys got their teams to a Super Bowl. Yeah. And, and it just couldn't, wasn't enough. couldn't finish it. You have Stafford ahead of Wentz, Ryan, Burrow, Cousins. So you're putting your rankings where your mouth is, as they say. I don't know if I like that, um, <laughs> but apparently um, I am. All right. Uh, George Kittle, 49ers tight end. You brought him up as, an, as a potential bounce, bounce back. I agree with you. Uh, we've talked a lot this offseason about the value of securing an elite tight end at the position. I'm interrupting. Go for it. I want Travis Kelsey. And I'm willing to pay a first for Travis Kelsey when I do these drafts. Yeah. I want Darren Waller. And I'm willing to pay uh like the back of the second yeah. for Darren Waller. I want them bad. Like I want to leave my draft with one of those two guys. I'm happy. Especially if I can get Kittle in the second. I have drafted or uh Kelsey in the second. I have drafted George Kittle in zero mock drafts, zero real drafts, so had the opportunity, I pass him by. This is a, re are you repenting? No, I'm saying that I want to be shown the error of my ways with what you're about to say, and you need to win me over here because I want to know if he could be better than those guys or will be, or or if is it foolish of me to be looking to Darren Waller over Kittle? Like, well, that win I think, this argument for me. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the. That's the debate. When I dug into this, the bounce back case for George Kittle, look, obviously his bounce back is not, or maybe not obviously, but it should be illustrated on the show. It's not a case of decline of performance or reduction of like involvement in the offense or a down. It's injury. Like his people, they, they know he finished at three and two at the position the preceding two years. But last year, his 17 game pace was ridiculous. It was 102 for 13, 47, and 13. Say that again. 102 catches. That's absurd. 1,347 yards. That's a great wide receiver. 13 touchdowns. Okay. Well, I'm in. So that, I mean, you could kind of just hit the gavel and end the conversation with that. But I think what it is is people look at Waller and they now see consistency over a couple of years. And you look at Kittle and it was a really painful, literally, figuratively, ride with George Kittle last year. He was 48 for 634 and two. You didn't get 102, 13, 47, and 13. Now, when I look back at his game logs, I see that in the games he did not score a touchdown, you know, you, you weren't really happy. He had a couple of, you know, tight end 18, 15, 20, very not Kittle-esque or even Waller-esque. Yeah, you didn't have the consistency. And you were dealing with injuries last season. Even in re even in his return, he was playing through it till he couldn't do it again. Then he came back for the last couple games of the year. That's where you saw some yardage return even without the touchdowns. 92 yards on four catches or four targets. Uh, no, four catches for 92 and then seven for 68. 
And so And he was consistent in twenty nineteen. Oh, very consistent. Very consistent. And he, you know, he put up a big year, dealt with injuries right in the middle of it. Um so I think that there are two kind of headlines for the bounce back for George Kittle. One, I think he's totally fair and appropriate to draft him ahead of Darren Waller. Like I don't think that, that you're committing a crime just because Waller had a big year last year. Like George Kittle's target share is going to be through the roof. It's twenty four percent last year during an injury riddled season. He's still number one in yards route per run at the tight end position. Um you're getting a bigger explosion player in George Kittle than you are Darren Waller. Uh but he's not Travis Kelsey. That is the other message. The tempering of the hype or potential bounce back. He just isn't. I mean, you look at the last three seasons for George Kittle. He is uh, averaging six for 75 and .4 touchdowns, 5.5, 86.3 touchdowns, six for 79.3 touchdowns. Those are not those are not Travis Kelsey's numbers. They're just below. But they're just below consistently, if that makes sense. So you're getting far better guarantee at health, far better guarantee of production with Travis Kelsey. That's not a shock or surprise. But here's who should target George Kittle. The people that draft at the top of your of your draft. Oh, you're talking like the two three turn. The two, the two three turn people, the Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey people. You get to go two three turn, take Kittle with one of those two picks, and then fill in your blanks from there. I think that's who should be targeting them. Kittle is in his prime. He's healthy. Right? I mean, he's no Kyle Pitts. You know. Uh, uh, Kyle Pitts clearly not genetically speaking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're different humans. Yeah, right. But uh, DNA, <laughs> they're literally different. But um, but I just think that uh, again, that short memory of fantasy players. If it's me, I uh, you know, I think Kittle is Kittle can offer your team more if everything goes right than even Darren Waller can, uh, because he can offer you double digit touchdowns. He can offer you number one, um tight end overall production. You remember he broke the record at the tight end uh, position in terms of receiving yardage uh, in back in, what was it, 18? Yeah, didn't he have it for like an hour? Was, uh, one I of think them... Kelsey had it for an hour oh. and then Kittle took it. Okay, that's the direction. Yeah, that was, that was the direction. Crazy. So, and and you want you want him to be able, you want the tight end that you pick at the first or second round to be able to go out you and win you a week go out there and win you a week number one overall tight end multiple times saw that in 2019 where he finished number one at the position you know three different times and in that top five a lot so you know it's one of those things where you have to throw you have to choose to throw the injury risk out if you don't want the injury risk if you think George Kittle it's inevitable that he's going to miss three or four games with injury then you go Waller I mean you do you don't have to you don't have to take that ride if you don't want to and and that's a pretty silly uh you know there there are a handful of players that I do avoid um because of injury risks ironically a teammate Debo Samuel who's been injured just about every year of his entire life back to high school but George Kittle has you know he's he played 15 games 16 games 14 games this was really the first season that was completely derailed by injury and and he tried to play through like there are also players who will play through anything possible to play through those are like Travis Kelsey has been injured more than you think he's just willing to fight through those things and that is like the heart of George Kittle if George Kittle you know can be out there he will be so I I, I do throw oh! he's a man uh, a couple of other points out there San Francisco has the um, fourth easiest schedule I believe or the easiest strength of schedule in the league is that easy? Fourth e easiest or easiest it's the easiest over? in the league because they were fourth in their division. Ah, last okay. Year. So they do have the easiest overall schedule according to Warren Sharp, at least. And then he averages the same. This is interesting. He averages the same yards per target as Tyreek Hill, ten point zero one. So that's that explosiveness that you see in the offense with George Kittle. So you know Kyle Shanahan is a, a genius play caller. He's not going to not use this weapon in George Kittle consistently. So. Barring injury, he's a guarantee top three at the position. Yes. So that's a big deal. I've got some other names. Okay. Let's hear them. This uh, is from uh, Twitter, Bounce Backs. Yeah, Zeke. I believe in a Zeke bounce back. You do not. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I can see it. I mean, I can see it happening. For uh, sure. I mean, all of these we can 
paint a, a yeah, picture. Calling for it calling whether it, yeah. we believe it's going to happen or not. I believe it will happen. You believe? Uh, I believe he belongs in the back half of the first. Okay. So, uh, Joe Mixon. I believe Joe Mixon bounces back and has a great season. I do too. Carson Wentz. So I was talking to Mike about this. I don't know if that you've heard this. That must have been a this. great conversation. Um, I believe he'll be okay for fantasy, but I, I think I've come to the standpoint where I don't believe he's a a really good quarterback. So I'm, I do I do not believe he'll bounce so, back. To so being I, the top I, leave, I leave for a day, and Mike Wright convinces you. This, has, his. this actually had nothing to do with any conversation with Mike. I was just letting him know the conclusion I came to on my own. I don't believe he's a good quarterback. Cooper Cup. I mean, you just talked about Matthew Stafford. His pathway to that season has to come through Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. Yeah, 100%. I, I think Cooper Cup is a value right now. People, I do too. There's too much worry about Woods and Cup not knowing who it's going to be, and so they've both kind of fallen a little bit in drafts to a good value. Uh, what about <laughs> OBJ? Nope. Uh, he, he will bounce back to exactly what he's been since leaving Eli Manning, which is worthless. Saquon. Yes, by the end of the season. Darnold? Wait, that's not a bounce back. You can't bounce know. back from a, what? A number of people put Sam Darnold in. I, from his college days to now? <laughs> I mean, is, that what he, is he bouncing back to college? I think, yeah, I mean, you're talking about, like, draft capital. You know, will he bounce back to what the thoughts of him were going to be? <laughs> bounce back to the dream? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I, I so desperately want to say yes. I believe I'd in like the to Carolina see the man offense. Exceed, to succeed. But it's just so hard because he's never been good. No, he hasn't. But so. the Adam Gase thing is real, man. You, you're with Adam Gase and you look bad. And then all of a sudden you get a good – because he's going from a bad coordinator to, I believe, a, a very good coordinator. So I'm a, I, mean, I am excited to see if, if Sam Darnold can be like, oh, yeah, look, the, the, the skill set and the tools that we all saw are, are there. And he's still so young. You know, it's not like he's cemented into what he's has to be forever. What were the what was the Panthers record last year? Below 500. I I don't know what to declare of Matt Rule quite yet. I feel like he gets <sighs> he gets a pass in the fact that like Christian McCaffrey wasn't there, right? But it should be said, right, that T Teddy Bridgewater was selected right mm -hmm. and then he was played mm -hmm. and then you can make fantasy arguments for Teddy Bridgewater but they were 5 and 11 and he's gone right like so we have done this right is that fair I mean we've done this one time Matt Rule has picked a quarterback brought him in been wrong and left he left town yeah it, it has could... anybody ever talked about that no <laughs> in, no, in I the mean... projection for Sam Darnold oh I, I think I think a lot I mean I think when you look, look all of our projections of Sam Darnold are more the Teddy Bridgewater than the breakout. I, I don't think we're calling for that. You know, I go back to uh, Matt Ja Rule's college resume, and maybe this is too much narrative leaking in, but I, I, I remember last year not wanting to forget this. The fact that program after program after program, Matt Rule would go in, and he completely turned around these terrible programs but the first year there for each and every one of them was trash. He just just comes in and it looks just like it was, and then the second year, everything turns around. And the way they drafted last year, entirely on the defensive side, super youth movement to the defense, I I do believe in the Carolina Panthers this year. I I do believe in Matt Jaw Rule, and I think... Well, they, they're not better than Tampa. No, they're no, not no. better than New Orleans. No, it's a tough division. To I mean, be in right they now. might be better than Atlanta. Yeah, I I'll, I could see that. I could see that. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And I look, I'd love to see Darnold succeed. I mean, if you're plunged into the hellscape of Adam Gaze, I'd like to see you emerge with a life like Ryan Tannehill managed to do. Me so too. it'll be be good for Robbie. Be good for DJ Moore and company. It's it's a good team for fantasy options too. So, all right, we're gonna do a dynasty download. <laughs> Dynasty Download. For those of you listening and not watching, today's Dynasty Download 
visuals were Mike on Powerline's body. And I believe that that is a heartbreak for Mike not being oh, able to be a part of that. I'm so happy he didn't see that. He would have been way too happy. <laughs> way too excited. But Jay Greer has got, got to peek at it. All right. Topic for today's Dynasty la- Download, Jason, is a, it's a subject that we've brought up in the studio recently mm-hmm. because part of the draft analyzer that we are, you know, a feature we're adding to it is if you have a Dynasty team, we want to give you an age breakdown of your team by player and position and show you plot out on a map peak production of players and then when the wheels start falling off, which I think right now in our draft analyzer, that's called the old busted years. Yeah. And so we're looking at running backs because we know how valuable they are to the season that you're in. You need them to win. And yet their shelf life in Dynasty Leagues is very, very short. And we had an article that went up on the website. Great article. Yeah, Marvin uh, put it up there, the life cycle of a Dynasty running back. And he looked at every running back season since 2000, looking at fantasy production and age. 57.4% of all RB1 seasons since 2000 fall within the age ranges of 23 to 26. So the likelihood of a running back being an impact starter for fantasy declines heavily at age 28. That would be the old busted age. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the old busted age, but that is... Starting to. So for the purposes of Dynasty, right? (laughs) You you know, last season, getting something for Todd Gurley in Dynasty was pretty much impossible. The season prior to that, you could get a haul for Todd Gurley. Now, Todd Gurley's out of the league. I mean, maybe he'll come back and be a backup somewhere. I expect he'll sign and be still irrelevant. And this happens over and over and over and over. It happens with every single running back, not named Emmett Smith, basically, that, you know, eventually the, 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 the game is over and it happens quick. It happens suddenly. And for the purpose of dynasty fantasy, you don't want to be caught holding the bag. Yeah, the bag has got no value. Right. That's the problem, right? Once you are holding that empty bag, you don't get any value for it. Right, and and what you can do is if you time it right, and obviously we don't have a crystal ball. Um, we don't know the future. So there's a, there's obviously we look at a lot of historical precedent um, and we try to get lucky, which is trading great fantasy running backs one year before the end. And that means they'll have a good season this year. But it means at the end of next season, the wheels will start falling off and the value will go way down. People won't pay up. Andy, we've brought this up before. You've done it time and time again. Uh, You traded Todd Gurley at peak for Dalvin Cook, who was not yet uh, broken out, and a bunch of other stuff. And, And immediately from there, Dalvin Cook was just the better player. You got the better player in the deal, and then you had multiple firsts or something like that. So maybe there's a couple things to remember, and I'm going to bring up four players that are at that year 26 or beyond, and we can say whether we believe you should make that move now. But I think the thing that is important is if you get real value for them today, it doesn't matter if they have a great season, right? You've brought that up a bunch. So I think maybe keep in, our, keep in your mind when we're bringing up these names, uh, trading them for a Cam Akers, a J.K. Dobbins, a DeAndre Swift, somebody in that young running back category entering that early peak and whether or not you'd make that move. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. I think that's the right way to look at it because, like you said, let's say the, wheels, tra- don't, the wheels don't fall off. Yes. Well, so what? You got – you got fair value, and so you you traded good wheels for good wheels. You're trying to trade one good year for four good years. Right. Pretty right. Math checks out. All right. Alvin Kamara is 26 years old. These are all running backs on their second contract. Do you trade Alvin Kamara now? So Alvin Kamara is one of those guys that is real. I think the opinions on him is very wide. There are some leagues that still believe Alvin Kamara is a star stud. He was, you know, in a lot of scoring formats, he was the number one running back last year. If you can get a haul for Alvin Kamara, I would trade. Uh, I would trade Alvin Kamara for, uh, you know, like a, a Cam Akers or or, or uh, Jonathan Taylor plus picks. If you can get the youth for Alvin Kamara, I would do that. He's one I wouldn't, and part of that is because of who he is and the fact that his fantasy value 
comes in the passing game, 80 plus receptions. And I think that that will be, I think that will persist for more than one more year. So yeah, I'll say no to that one. You'll say yes. Zeke, Ezekiel Elliott, 26 years old. I think you know my opinion there. I will say you should go get the haul for him right now. And I will say you should absolutely not go get the haul for him right now. You should go get the haul for him closer to August because I am telling you now when, when Hard Knocks comes out and he starts looking phenomenal and they're showing how much they're going to they're gonna be talking him up left, right, and center, I think you're going to get but way more But you say this him. year, do it. Yeah, I, okay. I, I do think if you can get Just peak, wait for a peak. I mean, I traded for Zeke this year in our Dynasty League. It was a Zeke and a pick. Um, you know, we've talked about that. If I could flip Zeke, even though I traded for him, if I could get a, a, a young stud running back in a pick, I would still do it. Derrick Henry is 27.5 years old. He is my number one. I brought this up earlier this offseason. If I'm in a dynasty league, I will not have him on my roster this year because you can get a haul for him. He's phenomenal, and you will. someone will pay a ton for Derrick Henry. I would do it. In a, like I would be a person to pay for it, not because I think the wheels won't fall off, but because of the context, right? Like I'm, I won last year. I want to win another season, uh, another championship. I'm willing to take the short term view. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do that. So I think the wheels, like we we're making arguments based on age. We didn't even bring up the Derrick Henry, like workload. Like nobody does that. Nobody the gets that work. 370 carry mark is a death knell. Yeah. And then you're at 27 and a half. You're not 26. So, um, no, I'm with you. That's what you should do. You should move him before the season in Dynasty. In Dynasty. And then Aaron Jones at 26.6 years old. Can't move him. You, you can I, probably move him. I don't believe you're with – until the Aaron Rodgers clarity happens. I don't know if everybody – I mean – I just don't think you're going to get enough because Aaron Jones is really good. Obviously, just signed a new contract, and, and so I, I think you've got a couple years left. I just don't believe you're going to get enough for him. I mean, any one of these guys, if I could get absolute bona fide young stud plus a first, I would probably do it for any of these guys. You just don't think that? I just don't think you're going to get that for because of the Aaron Rodgers So you're situation. stuck with Aaron Jones. Right. That's how it feels. Which I don't think is the end of the world for your team. No. Yeah. Oh, because no. You've like, got a good running back. It's always funny because we're sitting here w wondering what happens with Rodgers. Well, like, okay, obviously – the ceiling changes without Rodgers for Aaron Jones, but you know, there's hype for DeAndre Swift with Jared Goff in Detroit. Right. Fair. Like Aaron Jones is a great player, centerpiece of an offense that who knows if I mean if Rodgers isn't there, who knows if Adams is there? I mean, the way long he's term. tweeting. Yeah, I mean a long term. I'll bet I'll bet a couple years from now these Packers look significantly different it is really <laughs> really funny if you guys go back go to your favorite team whatever your hometown team is oh no go and pull up the 2017 roster it's just a couple years ago just go pull it up and and remind yourself of who played for your team we do that sometimes and we're in this you know full time and we'll go and look and we'll be like what we <laughs> had well, we had this guy on our rot i don't even remember that it's true the nfl changes fast all right, we want to thank Pristine Auction for supporting the show. We were talking about Mike Williams earlier. They have a Keenan Allen signed NFL football. Uh, the current bid price is 20 bucks. That ends on Wednesday night uh, after that game one victory for the Suns, maybe. Oh, yeah. Or do we have to go the opposite? Yeah, they're totally going to lose. Yeah, that's mm. what I mean. Fear the deer. Uh, Saquon Barkley signed jersey with the Rookie of the Year inscription on it. 50 bucks right now. That ends on Wednesday night as well. Use the promo code BALLERS. Get a $10 credit. That will do it for today's show. We're on to divisional breakdowns. That's what's coming up very soon. So for Jason Moore, Jay Grizz, Andy Holloway, take care, folks. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.